Well, good morning. Good morning, balcony. <laughs> one, one yell. I love it. It's your own little private space up there, isn't it? Well, grateful that you're here. My name is Danny, I'm one of the teaching pastors. If you're new here, uh, welcome. Uh, really welcome. We're glad you're here. We'd love to meet you uh, after the service. There's something that we call starting point. It's actually a little space out in the lobby. If you just walk right out a little bit to your right, it'll say starting point. We got a gift for you. Love to shake your hand. Our whole team tries to get out between services. So uh, we'd love to hear your story. If you actually came in this place like I did 17 years ago uh, with a lot of questions about faith, uh, I know when I came in 17 years ago, I had a ton of questions. I had studied all kinds of religions. And so uh, I came in with questions and I wish we would have had something that we have now, which is this course that has been developed across the world actually called Alpha. Alpha is a great course that you can be part of. It's a number of weeks. We have dinner as a, as a community, a small group, and then we uh, have a little bit of a teaching and then you sit around and tables uh, with people and you just ask these hard questions. <laughs> if you have hard questions, you start to process some of those questions. If you've been in faith for a little while, this course actually helps you to put language on your faith. It's really a beautiful space uh, to grow. So if you just go to our website, kensingtonchurch.org forward slash alpha, that's a way to connect. And also, if you don't have our app, Kensington Church app, you can just Google that and that you'll find it there. You can download it, it'd be great uh, for you to have that. That's a great way to connect with us as well. Well, for all the men in the room, let's hear from the men, come on. Wow, look at you, yes, those are men. Uh, we have a very, very serious announcement for you. And so why don't you check this out and then I'll give you some information. Man Up 2017, October 6th through 8th, it's back. We're gonna be at Spring Hill Camps with zip lines, tournaments, Man Up-a-thon, and incredible speakers like Dave Wilson, Patrick Holden, Cliff Johnson, and an interview with Ramesh and Steve Andrews. We're talking about the four stages of manhood. Well, the first stage is the cowboy stage, where we're talking... The second stage is the warrior stage, where we're oh, gonna be... Oh, oh. The third stage is the king stage. Bow and, to me. And the last stage we're talking about is the sage stage, you where we're shall gonna... Not pass. It's gonna be incredible. Invite your friends. <laughs> what are you doing, boy? Um, I'm doing a Man Up promo. Oh, third. that's cute. You're not doing a good job, though. It's okay. Well, You're not macho enough to do Man Up. Right? Hey, I got my camo on. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Playing dress up. Go ahead. Run along, son. I got this. Listen, man. This is gonna be the best Man Up you've ever had because... It's gonna be macho. How macho? Hey, 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 hey. That's right. It's gonna be that macho. Listen, we got all kinds of fun stuff. We got bare chested wrestling. We got porcupine tossing and tons of Vaseline. You're gonna wanna bring all your friends and neighbors. Sign up. That's Gandalf. All right, man, don't be scared. It's awesome. I'm telling you, our, our Man Up Retreat's coming up next weekend. You do not want to miss it. It is a lot of fun. We, we, we are super goofy, and we have a lot of fun, but it's actually very, very poignant as well and powerful uh, to be able to be in a room. I, you know, just, I won't be able to be there this year, but uh, the last, last year and then several years before, to be there and just absolutely watch men connect and talk and have this beautiful moment of connection uh, and spiritual growth is awesome. So you do not want to miss that. Be part of it a lot of fun and very impactful. You can go on the website and sign up for that as well. Speaking of retreats, we have a number of retreats coming up uh, for our younger students. And so th let me give you these. I'm going to kind of rifle them off, so stay with me real quick. The first one we have is our Club 45 Fall Retreat. That's actually happening. That's grades 4 through 5, and that's happening November 10th through the 12th. And you can sign up at kensingtonchurch.org forward slash events. If you have grandchildren, children, uh, neighbors, friends, all of that, sign up. These are very powerful for our kids. The next one is for middle school. It's called the Wild Retreat. It's for grade, actually, it's for grades uh, 6 through 12. So it's the past middle school. It's 6 through 12, October 27th through 29th. You can also go to kensingtonchurch.org uh, uh, forward slash wild. And then uh, we're going to have our 1829 group, our 18-year-old through 29. Whoop, whoop. Let's hear it for 1829. There you go, Ben. There you go. Uh, we have that retreat coming up. It's called Rise. It's uh, November 17th through the 19th. So great, great, great retreats coming up. Don't miss those. Go on our website and you can find all that information, go to our app as well. Well, today we're in the second week of a series that we're called Leave a Mark. 
And we really believe that every person, every community is designed by God to leave a mark where he has them for his kingdom. And so I wanted to celebrate something before uh, we greet one another. We want to celebrate a heart of who we are. In fact, Steve Andrews is going to come up today and guide us into the heart of really what Kensington is about. Because the first week was leave, leave a mark on your neighborhood. This week is leave a mark on your church. But part of our heart is to plant churches. And over these past 27 years, we've been a part of planting 58 churches uh, in our area and in the United States. And let me just, yeah, you can clap for that. Here, let me just give you a a few of the most recent ones. Detroit Church with Sonny Smith. Sonny Smith, wow, is he a great leader. Uh, Detroit Church, Sonny Smith in 2016. We have three churches starting in 2018. We have East Town in San Francisco with the Dupin family. Uh, Clint was our lead pastor at our Birmingham campus and felt called to go out to San Francisco. We have Boston Church with Colin and Liz Hartfield. Of course, they were our discipleship director here and they're just an intern director. Unbelievable. They're starting that church 2018. And Grunlow Church uh, with Shea Prisk. And that's happening uh, in Grand Blank. And uh, Grunlow Church is actually, it's pretty cool what happened because we have a sister church, Venture Church in Highland uh, with Terry Prisk. His son is now launching out of that. So we've been part of this kind of second generation of launching out of that church. It's just a, such a privilege. Now, here's the cool thing. Right now, it's 10, 1030, right? At 10 o'clock, a church started out in St. Clair Shores that was launched out of Clinton Township campus with 100 people that left there. And Dave Kubiak has started this morning Antioch Shoreline Church. And so we are so excited about that. So I wanna pray for them. And say, Lord, thank you. Right now, as Dave is probably preaching your word to that area, as he is it's just telling the story of how you are working through his life in that community, I pray your power and authority over that community. Father, you said that you give all power and authority. Now we get to go and make disciples and baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for what's gonna happen through Dave and his wife and their family in that community. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, awesome. Uh, Steve's gonna be up in a minute to lead us, but I would love for you to stand up and find someone around you you don't know, uh, give them a hug, and just tell them what you're gonna do today. Man, it's so good to see you. We've been having a great weekend. And isn't it, I tell you, this is incredible. Nobody, I I know you take it for granted, but uh, Danny mentioned it 58 times that we've uh, launched churches in the U.S. Our our church planning total around the globe is around 2,500 to 2,800. We're not sure exactly how many churches and house churches we've been able to start. And that, but what, what I love about the U.S. churches is we send and almost every one of these 58, we've sent people out. We just tell them to go. And people ask me, well, what's the difference between a Kensington campus, which there are eight that are meeting right now, right? There's eight places where people are gathering and talking about Jesus together. We're in fellowship and partnership together. The difference is that a church plant is like having kids. All your resources go out and none of it's ever coming back. <laughs> and so it's the truth. So, when, so Clinton Township is building a building and uh, which they're hoping to be in sometime in 2018. And while they're doing that, they're launching 100 people are just leaving Clinton to go help Dave Kubiak start uh, Antioch Church in St. Clair Shores. I just wanna tell you, this just doesn't happen that much. There, it's, it's a great business plan. Just give all your people away. Just give everything away. It's a great business plan. <laughs> My dream is that someday we will have given everything away. That would be super awesome. And you know, when you think about those 58 churches, it all started right here with this fellowship of people. A lot of you have been a part of that. And those of you that are new, we're inviting you into this great adventure to give your life away. Last week, we talked about making a mark, giving your life away. And uh, we talked about loving our neighbors. And uh, uh, it came to me that a couple weeks ago, I'd had a conversation with one of my neighbors. He said, after 24 years of us living by each other, he's retiring next year and he and his wife are gonna go live in their their small uh, small kind of, summer that's been their summer home up north and man I was so bummed out 
I said, wow, so I'm really going to miss you. Going to miss your ladder. <laughs> going to miss your tool set. And you know what? Your yard is my dog's favorite yard to poop in. <laughs> so thank you for 24, 24 years of love. Actually, you know what I said? I said, man, I'm going to really miss you seriously because we coached our kids in soccer together. We supported each other when we buried parents. We've journeyed through things like cancer, through brokenness of our children and our neighbors that we love. And I thought, what a wonderful thing to be able to listen in a neighborhood, to be able to have 24 years to listen to each other. And he and I, we see the world very differently on many, many issues. It doesn't matter when you get close. And before I even start today, I just want to say this. I've been trying to think about this in my lifetime. I've never seen people angrier than they are now. I don't think I ever have. People that are on one side are angry at the people on the other side. Everybody's angry at everybody. And I thought there's only one solution. People have, got to re, people have got to come to the table and have conversations. To say, I'm going to love you even if I totally disagree with you. I'm going to see you as Jesus sees you. That is something we have to offer to the world. And I thought, Steve Covey said it in his famous international bestseller 30 years ago. He said, really effective people seek first to understand, then to be understood. I thought the world could change if we said if we could really see with the eyes of Jesus. And when I thought about that, that's a huge part of the mission of the church is to leave a mark. Because I, I grew up thinking that the church was for insiders. I, honestly, the church I grew up with was the greatest people, but it was like people were pretending to be the kind of people that never sinned or made a mistake. And so I'd hear about somebody having a divorce. I'd be like, seriously? Because every time you saw them, they were scrubbed up and clean and perfect and going great. And I remember all those years ago, I thought if I ever get a chance to help a church, I'd love to be a church where people take the masks off. Where people could be real. No one from the outside ever seemed to get in. And if they didn't, they didn't seem to fit. So what is the purpose of the church? A few years ago, we put together a video this, I think, will help explain God's answer to that question. Take a look at this. Excuse me. Um, Tammy. Tammy, yeah. Uh, I think there's something wrong with these files. There's no diagnostic codes. What do you mean? No diagnostic codes. Oh. Um. <laughs> this one is totally blank, and uh, this one here, sleepy, and uh, this one says, happy to be here. I, uh... <laughs> yeah, on that blank one, we weren't sure what to put, and I figured since it was your first day, it'd be fun for you to figure that out. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Dr. Miller. You have a great day now. You too. Oh, and coffee's fresh in the lounge. Help yourself. Three-point shot. Scores! Yes. yes! Hello, I'm Dr. Miller. Hi, Dr. Miller. Yes. Oh, it's so nice to finally meet you. Likewise. I'm Sarah Edwards, and this is my husband, Jim, our son, Alex, and our daughter, Jenna. Great. Jim. What? Happy woo. Sorry, sorry. Welcome, Dr. Chicken. So, uh, which one of you is the patient? Oh, well, this is our hospital. I mean, we've been coming here every week. I, I don't even know what that means. Well, we've been coming here for 16 years. Okay, so let me get this straight. No one in this room is sick. No. Well, except Alex did have a little bit of a cold last oh, week. Okay. Oh, but he's all better now. Just a little bit of a sniffle. All right. Well, um... Looks like you guys are enjoying the game, so I'll be on my way. That's high score. You want to watch? <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, but uh, I'll be on my way. Nice meeting you. Oh, wait, you. Dr. Miller? Yeah. Um, now, I have noticed that they're still doing construction in the West Wing. Now, if they haven't picked the color tile yet, I really think that they should go with, you know, a sea green. Mm. I'll check on that for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it's nice to meet you. Dr. Jameson, please report to the 
Hi, Mr. Schaefer. Hi, I'm Dr. Miller. Oh, oh, are you the new doctor? Yes, I am. Well, that's good. Now that we have some new blood around here, maybe we can do something about the parking lot. I'm sorry? It needs to be completely torn out and repaid. How are our regulars supposed to get safely to their cars? <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, yeah. thank you. Sure. I'm you, Donna. Yeah? And this is my husband, Paul. Yeah. Are, are you in any pain? No, I'm not in any pain at all. Oh, okay. We're just Yeah, well, uh, your chart says, uh, come and see me, so. Oh, we just want to be here for your first day. Oh, I understand. I don't understand why we can't take care of a simple need like a parking lot. I mean, I've been here for 29 years and nobody listens to me. It's like I'm invisible. I'm sorry. You two, thanks for hurrying. Woo! <laughs> I need to see someone right away. But what seems to be the problem? Uh, I have a bolt in my face. I'm sorry, we're completely full. Oh, uh, well, what about all the beds? Oh, those are reserved for our established donors. Well, hello, Mr. Parsons. Welcome back. Beautiful day outside. It sure is. Well, we've got your suite ready with clean linens and fresh popcorn. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Sure. Look, I don't care if I have to be seen in a parking lot. I need to see somebody. I understand, sir. But our doctors are very busy. I have a bolt in my face! Please be seated. Why are these people not being seen? I'm sorry? These patients, why are they not being seen? Dr. Miller, we pride ourselves on making this a hospital that's a comfortable home for our, our members. I'm sorry, we have members? Yes, and all these people want to come in here with their complications. We just can't have that. I just want to make this clear, okay? So I work for a hospital that rejects sick people. Doctor, that's a little harsh. You work for a hospital that embraces the healthy. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. You don't even know if you should clap. Should you really clap for that? The idea of churches existing just for the people who kind of are in, who pay their dues, who have a seat. Is that what the purpose of the church is? Is that what the purpose of our lives is meant to be? Like to preserve a, a good life for our families and the people that are close to us? Or is it something more? By the way, that was one of the most outrageous videos we ever produced. I mean, I don't know who thought of that, but it actually comes from a passage of scripture. Jesus Christ came and shook up the world of Israel of his day. He rocked the boats of people. The Jewish culture was very highly religious and there were many, many rules and rituals and regulations that Jewish people should follow and many Jews still follow those rituals today. Jesus did not. And there was a moment where the, the top religious leaders were extremely offended and they came to him and they said, Jesus, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? This is in Luke chapter five, verse 30. They said, we don't get this. What, what does this mean? Because a good Jew would follow and observe the law. And one of the, the, the points of the law was you didn't eat with people that were unclean. If people weren't following the rituals of their faith, 
to eat with those people made you unclean, which meant you couldn't go to the temple to worship. It meant you couldn't lead in the synagogue. It, was, it, it puts you on the outside. So Jesus is acting in a way that puts him on the outside of his own people. It says, you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners. Now, if you're new to the Bible, the tax collectors were Jewish citizens who collected uh, uh, extortionary tax rates from Jewish people to go to the Roman government. And then they would get a huge kickback as a part of that. They were the most hated people of their day. Jesus is eating with the most hated people of the day. Think of this recent controversy of whether you stand or kneel at a football game. I talked to a Vietnam vet the other day. He was just apoplectic. He was so hurt by it. And I talked to people that were so, so hurt. What would Jesus do? Jesus would be eating meals with everybody. Like, think of the person you hate most in this culture. Jesus would be eating meal with that person. It's amazing to think about. It's actually pretty exciting. So instead of building walls of hatred, you start to step in to engage where people are. And they're like, we don't like this. You are not our guy. And Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Thus, the origination of a Kensington classic video, The Happy Hospital. It's not what it was made for. It's made to meet people at their point of crisis. It could be as nagging as a lingering cold. It could be as, as dramatic as a gunshot wound. My brother, who's five years older than me, he started his career as a trauma surgeon at John Gaston Hospital and City Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And he remembers operating on drunk guys in the hallway at the Gaston who were dying of bloodshot wounds where, because there were so many people sick and wounded, it was like a triage in a, in a war, where he says he remembers, my, my brother's my size, he remembers crawling up on the gurney where the person was, bleeding out of their chest. And because the guy was drunk, they couldn't settle him. So he remembers putting his knee pressure on the guy's shoulders to immobilize him so that he could actually operate and stop the bleeding in his chest. You see, that's what a hospital's for. And Jesus said, you know what a church is for? It's not for the healthy. Theologically, I just would love for you to see this. Jesus is saying, if you read the rest of the Bible, he's not saying the people that are healthy are really healthy. He's really saying there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are sick, but only consider themselves healthy. And then there are people who are sick and know it. Because I just want you to know something. In your life, you might have the most perfect life of anybody here or anybody listening on the stream today. But guess what? I've got, I, I, I'm actually the messenger of encouragement. Your life's going to take a turn. Nobody gets out of this life unscathed. Nobody. I know uh, I've had, had a chance to engage some of the most influential people in this region. And you know what? Their lives are just as difficult as all the rest of us. Because life is hard. Life is never gonna be settled. And Jesus said, I came to people that were sick because I wanna be where people are. He goes on to say in Luke 19, describing himself as the son of man. He said, the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. He's like, I'm, I'm here. I'm not here to help people that have it all together and don't need me. I'm here to help people that have a need. That's why I came to Jesus as a young man. I'm like, I grew up in an almost nearly perfect home. I had everything going for me. And you know what? I was miserable. I didn't feel like any of those things answered the ache that was in my heart. And when I turned my life to Jesus when I was 15 years old, it was a transformation. It didn't solve all my problems. It didn't take, I still struggle with anxiety to this very moment. But Jesus has been there every step of the way. It's amazing the comfort, the love that he's given me for enemies, the love that has been shown to me when people forgave me for the things that I did wrong. So if Jesus came for those who are far from God, then what should the mission of the church be? It's clear to reach those people. God is always sending people out. When people experience God, we're gonna talk about this in a worship series coming up Wednesday night, starting in Orion. We go back and forth on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock between Orion and Troy. We got a great series called Exhale. And it's where you, you connect with God and, and the result always goes this way. 
So if you're connecting with God and it never goes out in compassion to other people, it never goes out in serving, never goes out in risk-taking and giving your life to other people or sharing Christ or, or meeting people, then this isn't real. If you read the Bible, if this is real, this will be real. I was talking to a couple of guys last week in the lobby that are in Houston this week, tearing, tearing stuff out in people's homes with a group of people from Kensington. I said, guys, just wear your ventilator, please. Be careful about what you're breathing in. But it's, they don't care. They're there to do what? They've experienced this. They're going here. Just talked to another group that came back from a medical mission in Kenya. This is so cool when up leads to out. William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II. Imagine what a, what a strategic moment in time in England, 1942 to 1944. And this is what he said. You've heard me say it before. He said, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not its members. The key word here is not. I don't know of any organization in the world that says we simply exist for the benefit of others. Nothing else. We give our lives away. Jesus said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. Here's your retirement and benefit plan. Take up your cross and come with me. That's why the adventure of Jesus is so exciting. That's why when we started this church all those years ago, we said, listen, it's not about you. Take the worst parking spot, Come, take the worst seat. Do the hardest job that nobody wants to do. Let's give ourselves away for other people who don't even care that we're doing it. That's why the arrow in our logo, if you've ever downloaded our Kensington app, you've seen our app, the arrow points to the one. We're saying every person matters to God. And that one, it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Jesus is searching for you and wants to pull you close to his heart. That's why we decided in year one, week one, that we were gonna create a service that would invite people in to, to engage a living God that, that understood their life and loved them and could make a difference for every person. This is a true story. Recently, a Kensington person overheard a discussion at a local fitness gym. They heard these two, two guys talk and one person says, you know, I, I think I'm gonna go check out Kensington. The other person says, ah, I went there, I didn't like it. Probably me preaching. <laughs> he says, all they care about is human trafficking and global stuff. Stuff like helping people around the world. Don't waste your time. That was actually a real conversation. And I thought, that person was, was ripping us. I thought that's the best compliment anybody's ever paid to me in my whole life. Like put on my tombstone. All he cared about was stuff like human trafficking and people around the world. What a waste. Put it on my tombstone. You see, the whole perspective was for us to say, we care about the things that really matter, not just to us, but to people around the world. And so for us in Kensington, when you come to a weekend, you know what would be a win today if you left here today? If you're new today, if you've never been here before, which I'm sure there are many of you, a win for us today that it would be a service where you or, the or an unchurched person or the, or the friends that you brought would like to come to. And that you'd like to leave and think, man, I'd like to bring them back. I'd like to engage another time. That's why on any given weekend, there are 12 or 15,000 people at Kensington campuses. You know why they come? Because they're like you and me. They're looking for hope. They're looking for answers. They're looking for a journey along the way. And so to do that, whether it's at Man Up which by the way, I love that video, but you know what, there's a serious side coming to man up, Ramesh Sepkota from Nepal, our leader for human trafficking in Nepal, he and I, he, I'm gonna interview him on Sunday morning, it's gonna be unreal, talking to men about how we combat evil in this world. That's why I've just been begging the men that I'm bumping into to come. If you're a man, come and be a part of this. We'd love to have you, we'd love to have you, we'd love to have you. Would love to have you. I'd love to just, let's be in a journey. Let's come together and men say, we are gonna stop the object, objectification of women and children. We're gonna stop the human trafficking that's exploding in this country. We wanna give our lives away. It does not, we do not exist as followers of Jesus Christ only for ourselves. Right, guys? So that's why I'm hoping you're gonna come. So when you come, whether it's that or student ministries tonight, there's four things we try to do. It's not rocket scientists. Science is just something we try to do. Number one, we try to meet people where they are. As I said earlier, people are frazzled in a hurry. They're anxious. We try to make it easy to come in. We try to, for, if you've brought your kids, we want you to know that your kids are gonna be absolutely safe and protected and loved as well as inspired to follow Jesus here. 
It's hugely important to us. That's why we have people greet. That's why you see all of us in, in between services, hanging out in the lobby, just talking, having conversations. I've had, had five or six phenomenal conversations already this weekend with people. I'm just amazed at the people God keeps bringing here. So you say, well, how do I do this? See, because here's, here's a really, this is actually an interesting stat. You know that they've done studies that your neighbor will decide, if you bring a neighbor or a friend, they're gonna decide if they're coming back in 11 minutes. In other words, before the speaker of the day even gets up to speak, most people decide whether they're coming back or not. You know what I'd like to say to that? That's pretty discouraging if you're the speaker. I'm thinking about dropping my prep time because obviously it doesn't matter. No, it does matter, but, it's, but it's so, it tells you how important that people, real people meeting real people. And I love the people that are coming. I love the diversity that God has brought to this campus. I love the fact that we're moving and engaging people and, and we, we have so many great opportunities. When I come on a weekend, I know it's gonna be exhausting. I know it's gonna be intense every step of the way. We're doing dinners and, and coffee house, coffee meetings, and I'm meeting with people all, all fall. It's very, very intense. And sometimes I get tired, just like everybody else, right? We all get tired. I have a little game I play to meet people where they are. You know what it is? I have different pictures in my mind, but lately the picture that I have in my mind is this one. This is the picture. As I'm getting ready to come here on the weekend, I look at this picture. It's on my, it's on my iPad and my phone. These are four of my grandchildren. These two are biological. The two that are wearing, the, I don't know, recognize what they're wearing. Some, some <laughs> something, not sure what that is. Um, does anybody know? <laughs> okay, I just lost credibility with half the room. Um, this is my other daughter, Nancy, who actually leads the Kaleo kids here. When you see the kids perform on stage, she writes that and leads that here at the Troy campus. She's my, my sweetie and my second daughter. Um, these two are adopted. And what's interesting to me is when I, when I get ready to come here and I get ready to see you and meet you, I look at them and I'm reminded of the fact that if Jesus Christ is alive from the dead, if he really did die for the sins of the world, then every person matters to him more than these four matter to me. So when I look at you, I'm not judging you. I'm looking at you like I would see my own grandchildren, like the value that God, I know that the, the love that God has for you is infinitely greater than the love he has, than the love that I have for them. And boy, I love them. I mean, when you're a grandparent, all the grandparents know this, this, there's no, no greater joy than being with your grandkids. And I live, I live a very exciting life. Honestly, I travel the globe. I do really, I do dangerous stuff. I, I have tons of friends, but these are my best pals in the whole world. And when I see you, I wanna, this is what I see. By the way, this is fun. My second daughter, she and her husband have been married almost seven years, no, no children, biological children. We, had, we adopted Isaiah. You, you've seen his face. I got to get to show his face. I can't show you Johnny's face because he's not legally my grandson yet. And until that happens, you can't, you're not allowed to post things, social media in public. But here's what's fun is he, he turns four tomorrow. And on Wednesday at the Oakland County Courthouse, he becomes my forever grandson legally. So it's pretty exciting. And one other thing, one other thing about just meeting people where they are. Um, adopted him in March, so he's gonna be October. In May, at, at, at my third daughter's graduation in Malibu, it was the weekend where Danny invited everybody to come down and leave their prayer requests on the stage for a miracle. And I was out in California, but I saw the end of the service and I cried because I saw all these people coming down and leaving the prayer requests, all the miracles we want. And I prayed that day. I said, I just said, Lord, I would love for Nancy and Daniel to have a biological child because they've done such a great job with their adopted kids. The very next day, we're going out to sushi and she goes, hey, we're going out to sushi tonight and everybody knows I love raw fish. Well, I'm not eating raw fish tonight and everybody's going, going, to want, want, going to want to know why. I took a pregnancy test this morning. I'm pregnant. So she's pr 23 weeks pregnant with their third child. So... So she's gone in one year from zero children to three children. <laughs> so she's relaxed. She's got a lot of extra time if you need her between that and Kaleo kids. <laughs> Here's what I know. 
Every one of you is like my daughter Nancy or my grandkids. Some of you feel abandoned. Some of you have felt loved every step of the way. But Jesus' love for you is immense and incalculable. We want people to know that. We want to meet people where they are. And you know what I love about Jesus? He said, hey, it's not the healthy, need the doctor. It's the sick. Jesus engaged in a gut level honesty and met people at their place of pain. He was, and he was like saying, listen, everybody matters. That's why the Luke 15 story last week, when the one sheep wanders away, the shepherd risks all to find the one that's lost. And I didn't read this verse to you last week in 15 verse seven. Jesus said, I tell you in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. You know what he's really saying? He's saying one person that repents is what makes heaven rejoice other than 99 people who think they've got it all together. We've always said this for 27 years. If you've got it all together, you're gonna hate this place eventually. Because other than me, everybody else is screwed up. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> We're all broken, right? But Jesus is doing something beautiful in us. Last week in the lobby, a young man, just a really handsome young guy in the military, comes up to me and goes, hey, I gotta tell you something. After the mess, he goes, I was the one. He says, I got moved here by the military from Seattle to Detroit. That was pretty disappointing. I'm like, really? I've never heard that. I've never heard anybody get transferred to Detroit that was disappointed by it. <laughs> I thought everybody wants to live here with us. He goes, for six months, he says, I lived in self-imposed misery. And then somebody mentioned, you know, and I thought I should go to church and I tried Kensington, I walked in the door, I was welcomed by so many people and the 18 to 29 age group people that are so awesome here, incredible group people, embraced him, encountered him and he said, you know what, I, I was the one, this reconnected me to Jesus. I'm like, dude, if that's all that happened in 2017 in my life, my life would have been worth it just to be a part of a church that would welcome and some, help you find community. He says, and by the way, I'm being transferred back to Seattle this week. Dang. There it goes again. But anyway, the joy of seeing him connect, that's what it means to meet people where they are. The second one is to expose the struggle. When we do that, the man up video or what you just saw on the video, we wanna open a question of a video or an experience or somebody talking about a journey or struggle or problem we all deal with. Because we all struggle with many things. Let me tell you some things I heard this week. I doubt sometimes, I question God a lot, I give in to temptation, I lose my temper, I wanna toss my kids, my wife is imperfect, I get mad at God, I get mad at our neighbors, I get mad at the dog. If you're getting mad at the dog, you need help. That's <laughs> like when it gets to the dog, you need to get some help. You get discouraged, you lose hope, you lose joy. You can't find happiness in what you're doing. You feel lost, feel confused. You just want relief. I could go on and on all day. And those are just my issues. Those are just mine. We wanted to be a, I'm serious. Those are mine. I don't know. And I'll bet you every one of you is resonating with those and a dozen more. We wanted to be a church where people, when we expose a struggle, that people would say, me too. Yeah, me too. Anybody here today discouraged about your children or grandchildren, some issue that's happening for them? Any, anybody discouraged? Me too. Anybody feeling anxiety that's wearing you down? Yeah. Me too. I mean, that's it. I mean, it's what, whatever you got, I'm just gonna say me too because I... I am as flawed a person as anybody in this room, and yet I'm so grateful for who Jesus is. And I want to tell you, two weeks ago, Andrew Kim was visiting, and he spoke, and he talked about his high school years being bullied. I got to tell you, when he said that, I, never, I don't ever remember anybody saying that from the stage. You could feel it in the room. People leaned in, and you didn't hear it out loud, but you, you could feel it in the air. People saying, me too. Expose the struggle. That's what we try to do every week. It's just super important. As long as we're here, we're gonna to try to do that. And then number three, we wanna to point to the solution. We know that there, these struggles are real. We know we're broken, but we know where to find healing. And here's the answer. It's really complex. 
His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. No, not that one. That's Jesus, master teacher, but his name is Jesus Christ. That's who we point to. Every service, every small group, every moment that we're together, I want to say to you, I think Jesus Christ is the answer. I want to tell you something. When, in the 60s, when I was a teenager, there was a huge move to believing that science was going to have all the answers to humanity. And then I would say in the 70s and 80s and 90s, there was a real strong skepticism about science really providing all the answers to the needs of our lives. In the last decade, I'm hearing it again, just like I heard in the 60s. People really think that scientists are gonna unlock the meaning to life and unlock the meaning to happiness. You might be one of those people in this room and you might be right. Here's what I wanna tell you. I don't agree. And I would simply say to you, or to anybody in my life who thinks science is gonna have all the answers, like, man, go for it. But at the end of the day, if you feel lonely, if you feel like your life is worthless, there is one voice in the world who says, I came and died for you and rose again from the dead for you to give you life and give you life everlasting. That your life not only matters now, you're not just a particle in this universe, but your life matters now and it matters forever. And if you want that hope, Jesus is gonna be here with arms open wide. He doesn't care how many years you spit in his face. He'll still be standing with his arms stretched out to you. Jesus is the answer, I think. And we'll always point to Jesus. I love John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin and was like, like the person preparing the way for Jesus. When he saw Jesus, he said this. He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus hadn't even done anything yet. He was just starting his public ministry. But John believed. He said, look, he's the Lamb of God. Interesting, he picked this word. What's more helpless than a lamb? There's only one thing in the world more helpless than a lamb. What is it? A human baby. Human baby, probably nothing, nothing more helpless than in, the, in the world than a human baby other than a lamb. He says, look at the lamb of God. He knows he's gonna be already, John the Baptist, he's gonna be the sacrifice to take away our brokenness. Jesus is the answer. But you know what else is cool? You find out later, he's not only the lamb of God, he's the lion of Judah, right? That's the tribe of Judah of which the Messiah came out of. He's the lion. He's the victor. He's the king. He's the, and when you read in the end of the book, in the book of Revelation, his eyes are sh like, sh like blazing fire. That's what his eyes are like in his glory. And he's got the answers to our needs. That's why we declare week after week, Jesus is the answer. The fourth thing that we do every week. So we try to meet people wherever they are, expose the struggle, point to Jesus as the solution and respond accordingly. That's it. That's what we do. When we planned, we planned this service, that's all we did. After presenting the truth of Jesus, we invite people to respond. And what I love about this, if you're new to here, I just wanna tell you the one thing that I've loved in my life here is that when we ask people to step up, people go. Do you realize we've had thousands and thousands of people leave Kensington to go start other churches? Thousands have left here. We've lost their giving, we've lost their serving, we've lost their partnership because we asked them to do what? To follow God, not follow us. To follow Jesus, not follow us. Not, we're not keeping anybody. And if you stay, you stay to be on mission with us, to find that Jesus loves you, and then let's go, let's give ourselves away. I was thinking of the 20, about 2,500 churches that exist in 10 different countries because of your faithful giving and partnership with, the, with le national leaders of those countries starting churches. We've always been a go culture. The word that describes people here, when I look out of this room, I look at you, it's like the word go. We put the challenge, you go. We ask you to run, you run. We ask you to give, you give. We ask you to serve, you serve. If, if God is moving in you to start a new ministry that nobody else can do, we tell you to do it. We tell you that you're the strategically placed where no one else is placed to reach the people that you can reach. So go, respond. And sometimes response in the service is pretty exciting. We have great moments in here. We're gonna have a great moment here at the end of this day. Kind of like when Golden Tate caught the winning touchdown Sunday. Wasn't that fantastic? Come on, let's give it up for the Lions. I talked to like four or five guys. They're like texting their friends, Lions win. Talked to a guy in the lobby. They're hugging and people are crying in the stands. 
And then we find out he's a half inch short. The story of, of our football legacy in this city, a half inch short. I actually was busy all Sunday, couldn't watch the game. I watched the game in my basement at 1030. Just kind of fast forward through it and I'd kept secret all day. I didn't know who, who won or lost. I knew the, that, that the Falcons had been up big. I didn't know the Lions had come back. And uh, I jumped out of my chair about 1130 Sunday night. And then like everybody else, I just groaned. That's what response is. Response is you, you respond when you're moved by something. And you know what we want to move you with? We want to move you with the love of God. The fact, the love that brought Jesus from heaven to earth to reach you. That's what we wanted. Sometimes we sing and praise God at the end of our services. We join in praise. It's, it's one aspect of worship. But you remember every moment is worship if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Every smile you give to a person. Every time you, you let a person in front of you who's been cheating down the, 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 you know, the lane that's closing and you let them in front of you in kindness and you don't give any, any alternative signs to them, that's an act of worship. That's really, you're honoring God. You're saying, God, because I love you, I'm gonna let this jerk in. And then you find out the jerk was me. You see, sometimes we praise God, it's all great. Sometimes we're so broken, we can't even lift our heads up. We just put our heads down, we can't even sing. We're gonna sing at the end of the service. Some of you, you're not even gonna be able to sing today. Life is so heavy. It's great. Don't sing. Put your head in your hands if you want. You're loved. Jesus came for you. I wanna finish with one of my favorite stories. Before I do, I want the ushers to come down to receive our offering. We'd love to have you come down at this time. And uh, by the way, this giving offering moment, it's also worship. You give, if, if you give, if you're visiting, you say, I'm not sure about Kensington, then don't give. If you like what we're doing, then throw a whole bunch of money in there. It'd be great. Awesome. Just drop it in, <laughs> pile it in. But it's worship. When I rocked my grandson, I had two, two of our grandkids sleep over last night and I read books to him and rocked him to sleep. It's worship because I'm doing it in the name of Jesus. Because I know the love that I have for him comes from Jesus. And so as we receive this offering and we finish, I just wanted to leave you with this thought. We respond to God because we have hope of what he can do in our lives. And in Luke 7, 36 to 38, said one of those Pharisees that didn't like Jesus hanging with the sinners. Do you remember that at the beginning of, of, of this hour? They invited Jesus to have dinner with them. And he went to this house. And what's interesting is when you, in, in ancient, that ancient Jewish culture, if you welcome somebody to your house, the first thing you would do when they came into your door, do you know what it'd be? You'd wash their feet. But in this case, because they had already had the made up their mind that they hated Jesus, they didn't wash his feet. They didn't show him any respect so Jesus is in eating with this group of Pharisees and they're all staring daggers at him. They don't like who he is. And right as he's doing that, it says a woman in town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. And so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. An alabaster jar would have been very expensive. The perfume would have been very costly. A lot of people think that this woman was a prostitute and had made this money through prostitution. We don't know that for sure, but it was very, very valuable. She comes weeping on Jesus' feet and wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. Among a bunch of really stuck up religious people who are as uncomfortable as they'll ever be in their whole life. And then she breaks the jar and pours it all out on his feet. She was preparing Jesus for his death. What would invite such a response? That's the question that every living human being has to ask. What would touch you enough that you would give your wealth away? A symbol of your sacrifice, a symbol of your brokenness. What would it be? You know what it is for me? It's the fact that Jesus came. It's the fact that God loved the world so much 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. That's worth breaking an alabaster jar over. So in this time, in this time of response, some of the time you're gonna sit quietly, some of the time you're gonna sing, let God's love wash over you.
on a hill you created The light of the world abandoned in darkness to die And as you speak A hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so will I I can see Continue worshiping with one final song. 
And as we sing about God's amazing and unfailing love, I would love for us to just invite that powerful love into our hearts so that we can go and in turn share it with others. So let's just sing and cry this out together. I gotta tell you that So Will I is maybe my favorite new song. The theology behind that. And what was the phrase? Something about when the, eight, the, the failures, what's the line, Michael? He breathes out and, and 100 billion failures disappear. disappear. Yeah. Is that incredible? How many people got like maybe a couple hundred failures? 
It's like he wipes them out. If there's 8 billion people, then that's about um, at least 12 failures. Maybe it's gotta be 100 trillion, maybe. So here's what I wanna finish with. I'm smiling and you're gonna think I'm sick, but I buried my Aunt Patty this past week. And I'm smiling because she was 95 and she was, she was just awesome. But man, she, her, her, bones, her bones weren't singing at the end, you know, like we just sang and she was really struggling, but God's faithfulness carried her to the very end. In the last couple of years, every morning when my niece, Claire, she and her husband and children live with my mom, her, their great grand, grandmother and she would wake Aunt Patty up and every morning Aunt Patty would go, am I still here? <laughs> that alone is one reason why I believe in Jesus. Because man, there's gotta be something more than here. There's gotta be someone that loves us forever. And if not, I don't know, go hug your science book. But if he really did come into this earth and live a sinless life and be rejected by us and defeat death once for all in the grave and he left the grave, then so will we. That's pretty awesome to think about. So, and as a result, it gives us a vision to go and engage the world with everything we got. So Jesus Christ, thank you for coming, for loving. Thank you for this time of response where we, where we, as we go through this week, may we reach up to you and receive from you vertically and then and horizontally just go out to love people like we never had before and help us love our enemies, help us love our families, help us love our dog, help us live in the way you've called us to live because you're alive and we're so glad. Help us meet people where they are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, awesome. So come down and pray, come to starting point and men, I want some men to join me and man up. Come on, let's do it. See ya.